Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast from Equifax, where we break down the latest economic and credit insights to help you navigate today's business landscape. Welcome to the Market Pulse podcast. I'm your host, Catherine Doe, Product Marketing Director for our risk portfolio here at Equifax. We're wrapping up with our third and final episode in our series with Chris Doritas, Deputy Chief Economist at Moody's Analytics. Today, we're focusing on consumer and commercial lending in 2023, what the economic conditions may mean for lenders, and how they can best strategize to find responsible growth even in challenging environments. Let's dig in. Knowing what we do about our economic outlook for 2023, including the labor market, and a reminder for our listeners, be sure you listen to the previous two episodes in this series, if you haven't already. What are you and Moody's Analytics anticipating in terms of lending trends, volume? Um, Will particular lines of credit do a little bit better in 2023 and, and, and maybe others that you think we'll see pull back? I would say that what is clear or what is definite is that we will see a slowing in originations. Clearly, with higher interest rates, the demand for uh, loans will and lines of credit will will be pulled back. Right? It's just uh, expensive, and uh, people respond to prices. So you're already seeing that in the most interest rate sensitive part of the market, which is real estate. Clearly, refinancing volume is down to a, a trickle. Not many opportunities for a refinance in this um, upright environment, and even purchase mortgage volume is down and is likely to remain depressed while rates remain high and rising. Right, that's uh, quite clear. Uh, on the commercial uh, side of things, similar trends would be expected. Although we do expect that economy will slow, but not actually go into a, a broad-based uh, type of recession. That doesn't mean that businesses don't think twice about investing and expanding their operations at this point. Again, it's it's more costly to borrow, and for that reason, they're going to be much more judicious in terms of accessing uh, credit. So would expect to see that, that type of a slowdown in origination volumes. That doesn't go to zero, of course, but uh, definitely won't be as, as strong as uh, it may have been in the last year or so. In terms of performance, we'd also we would expect to see delinquencies and default rates rise as the economy slows. Some consumers, some businesses will face challenges with a higher interest rate and with a slowing economy in terms of falling revenues. And of course, we should expect then to see defaults, consolidations, mergers, and acquisitions as some businesses are are forced to exit their operations. That said, we're not expecting a, a very significant or substantial recession unless we get hit by some other unforeseen shock here. Obviously, there are lots of things that could happen, whether it it is another uh, very large wave of COVID or some other type of uh, shock to the economy. There's lots of geopolitical risk, of course, across the globe. So lots of things can happen. But assuming nothing major happens, we wouldn't anticipate a very large run-up in in defaults or or delinquencies at this point. More of a normalization, if you will, back to pre-pandemic trends. During the pandemic, we actually had delinquency and default rates that were ultra low. And so we're really just getting back up to uh, some of those earlier trends. There are some pockets, of course, that will see some stress. We see that both on the consumer side as we start to look at some of the personal loans, um, more subprime uh, parts of the market, and then on the business side as well. Clearly, there are, there are some businesses that are facing more stress than others just based on, on what's going on with the broader economy. Is there any consideration or potential impact with having just gone through midterm elections and our congressional makeup? Will that matter at all, you think, in terms of policy? So we have a split government now in terms of the uh, the House and the Senate, and then, of course, the uh, the Democrats in the, with the presidency. What that means from an economic perspective is that we are unlikely to see any major tax or spending uh, packages passed anytime soon within this administration. So there, I guess on the one hand, that provides a little bit of certainty to businesses in terms of what they can expect. The tax environment is going to be what it is. The government support or the government spending environment, unlikely to change as well. So maybe that helps to some extent with, with planning. There are some risks uh, out there with the split government when we think about the need to uh, fund the government. There's going to be a budget uh, that comes due uh, pretty soon here. So there could be a little bit of brinksmanship between um, between the parties to iron out budget, but I'm assuming, at least in our baseline forecast here, we're assuming that we work out some type of uh, compromise and avoid a a broader-based government shutdown. If that doesn't happen, a a shutdown does have economic consequences, so clearly that's something to watch out for, but again, not seeing that as uh, 
the most likely outcome. I do worry about the um, debt ceiling uh, debate. National debt ceiling has to be raised again. Probably, um, it, it's uncertain this specific timing, but most likely uh, by summer, or early fall, we will need to uh, to see that that ceiling raised again. There could be uh, again some brinksmanship. Uh, that played there, and that's that's a bit dangerous, right? It, if the U.S. government were to default on on its debt, that uh, certainly would have major economic uh, downside. So I don't see us going down that path, but clearly a risk uh, that is out there. Other than that, I don't see the midterms as, as having a, a significant impact on our outlook, either positive or negative. When building your marketing programs, are you confident you're targeting the right businesses and buyers? With the B2B Connect database from Equifax, you can tap into the B2B account data you need to prospect, segment, and retain key clients across various industries and geographies. To learn more about B2B Connect, click the link in our show notes. And so you mentioned a few challenges uh, in, in lending looking into the next year, especially with interest rates and also it being more expensive to borrow for, for consumers. Are there any other challenges or even within that challenging environment for lenders? How can they manage better? Is it through additional data, expanding their portfolio or their, their pool and who they're lending to? How can we balance, again, opportunity and risk in lending? Here, too, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the market, I would say, across asset classes, across industries, across a number of, of different dimensions. So data and tools certainly are going to be helpful. As I look at the commercial lending landscape, I do expect to see more challenges in the um, commercial real estate or CRE uh, market uh, going forward. It's been a bit of an anomaly in terms of what we've seen from uh, CRE prices. We really haven't seen much of a, a correction or adjustment in the post-pandemic era here. I think the low rates have certainly allowed a number of uh, commercial real estate owners and, and lenders to, to wait and see uh, what happens. But with rates rising, there's going to be more pressure from a cash flow basis on some of those CRE properties. And we also are still figuring out the, the whole hybrid work or remote work dynamic. That's really going to decide how much off office space, retail space, we actually need going forward. So of all the commercial lending markets out there, I, I would pay special attention to CRE. That's where I would expect to see some of the most immediate changes or adjustments here in terms of performance and, and volume going forward. More broadly uh, than that, again, I think there are opportunities in every market, in every industry, but we need to have precision data to really understand the risks uh, that we're, we're taking on and to price accordingly. A lender can operate profitably in any market, even in a, a slowing market, even during a recession, but they need to have the right tools, the, the right uh, analysis in order to properly assess and price for uh, the risks uh, that are out there. Do you think that there are any particular trade lines that we'll see increase in volumes in 2023? Just thinking about, gosh, a, a year ago, I was on this podcast and we were talking about buy now, pay later. Didn't know where that would would we'd find um, volumes for that in the next year. Or credit cards, if we see um, stressed consumers, uh, personal loans, consumer finance. Any insight you can share on on that? We are seeing an increased origination volume when it comes to buy now, pay later, the personal loans and the credit cards, as you mentioned. And we do see consumers tapping into those uh, products. I would expect, as usual, uh, somewhat of a debt consolidation cycle after the holidays. All right, So as we get into the new year, would expect that there would be opportunities perhaps for lenders to, to consolidate some of those debts for, um, for consumers, offer them a better rate than the, what they might be getting on some of these other products. And so I, I think that's uh, to be expected. It's part of the natural credit cycle in terms of how we uh, tend to spend and then uh, consolidate that. So I, I would see that that occurring there. So that's what that's one potential opportunity. I remain quite optimistic despite slowing economy, potential recession risk. I do ex remain quite optimistic in terms of the small business space broadly. Small business applications remain have remained surprisingly high. We saw applications for employer identification numbers at the IRS rise substantially during the pandemic. And we thought, well, that kind of makes sense. Weak labor market, people are looking for other opportunities, thinking about the future, wanting to keep their options open, maybe thinking it's a good time to go out and strike uh, on, the, on their own. And we have seen some pullback in those applications, but really 
I haven't seen much of a sharp decline. And so the, the number of people still expressing a desire to start a small business remains above where it was prior to the pandemic. So I do expect to see that those opportunities to lend, to support those businesses, those fledgling businesses will arise. And one thing I always want my lender partners to keep in mind is that recessions are tough, certainly, but they also do uh, sow the seeds for future growth. And some of the, the largest, most successful companies were, were founded during recessions. And also some of the best performing loan vintages actually were originated during recessions when credit might be tight. You do have to be uh, judicious in, in your lending. But the borrowers that you do extend credit to may turn out to be some of your strongest performers throughout the business cycle. That's so interesting. And thank you for uh, teeing up a great soundbite for us with, with that comment. And so in closing, I'm going to go back to my favorite question. In thinking about lending as a whole, what are you not being asked by any of your consulting engagements or your, your lender partners that you think you should be advising on more? What are people perhaps not focusing on that they should be? Again, I would say uh, focus on, on the longer term. But uh, more specifically for, for lenders, I would say I have been continued to be concerned uh, a bit about uh, credit score inflation, right? So we saw that credit quality improved dramatically during the pandemic, right? We saw delinquency rates falling to, to record lows. Part of that was uh, due to an injection of, of incomes, right? So government stimulus, unemployment insurance certainly helped our consumers. Uh, programs like the PPP helped businesses, right? So they were able to, uh, to manage their finances actually overperform. That led an improvement in, in credit scores. Uh, borrowers or consumers also didn't have all the spending opportunities they otherwise might have. So savings rates actually went up and that also helped to or made it easier uh, for them to uh, to make payments in addition to student loan deferments and some support in terms of, uh, of mortgage payments. Consumers and businesses overall were in a pretty good uh, credit environment. So their credit scores improved and on paper they looked uh, quite strong. Now those trends are going to reverse though. That support is going away. And so I, I want to be cautious uh, as a lender at uh, relying too heavily on uh, credit scores, which which may look great at the moment, but as we get into more of a normalized economy, we might see some reversal here. So that um, credit score, uh, that borrow with a 700 credit score today may uh, see a, a shift in that credit score down to 690, 680 within a few months. So we just want to be very cautious in terms of where we are in the cycle uh, in terms of using the credit score. This, the scores still have great value in terms of the relative risks, but be aware that uh, certainly they can shift and we, when we're setting our lending standards, we should be mindful of that uh, going forward as well. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Chris. We certainly appreciate it. Equifax and Moody's Analytics partner on our credit forecast solution, which provides rich insight into how the U.S. and local economies affect consumer credit behavior and performance through a full spectrum of consumer credit services. You can learn more at creditforecast.com. Also, be sure to check out and register for our Market Pulse monthly webinar series. You can find that at equifax.com forward slash Market Pulse. And lastly, let us know how we're doing and what you might like to hear more about in the future in episode episodes of this podcast. You can email our team at marketpulsepodcast at equifax.com. Thanks so much, and we'll catch you next time. The information and opinions provided in this podcast are intended as general guidance only and are subject to change without notice. The views presented during the podcast are those of the presenter as of the date this podcast was recorded and do not necessarily reflect official positions of Equifax. Investor analysts should direct inquiries using the contact us box on the investor relations section at equifax.com.